Hello, and welcome again to Write Designs, the video blog for Write Publishing. I am your host, Stephen D. Russell, uh, CEO of Write Publishing. I'm here to talk today about something I get asked a lot. I get emails, I get Facebook questions, I get instant messages, and I could write a book and make money off of this, but a lot of folks helped me get to where I am without, you know, requiring me to hand them money. And while I don't have time to anymore to stop and ask everyone who asks me the question, how do I create my own tabletop RPG company or how do I get my game published? Um, and those are two very different things. Um, Lewis Porter Jr. talks about this all the time. Do you want to be a game publisher? and a businessman or do you just want to publish your game? If you just want to publish your game then you need to find a publisher and just you know connive them into publishing your game. Um, and what I mean by that is you have to understand that every publisher has his own games ideas that he wants to publish and he has lots and lots of them and he doesn't have time for them. So the people I allow I hate to say that, the people who end up having their game published by me tend to be people who do a lot for me that I can't, that I would be incredibly guilty for if I turned them down on any idea they had. Um, if person X who's been with me for, uh, I'll give you a prime example, Dave Paul, my editor, worked for me for a really long time, um, came to me with the idea that he wanted to do a series of terrain spell books. Now we had done a thousand and one spells and I was sick to death of spells. But you know, Dave Paul wants to do something, Dave Paul gets it, we do it. You know, if you know Perry Grossens came to me and said, I want to write book X, I would say finish your editing job and you can write whatever the hell you want. But you know, that's beside the point. But um, that's a lot of the way it works uh, sometimes. So that just gives you an idea of how to get your game published is to start and ingratiate yourself with a certain company that you like and respect and, you know, show them that you're reliable and show them that you can produce work and, you know, when they're impressed with you, then they may consider publishing your game. That's my evil way of doing it, you know, otherwise you can just pitch your idea and hope they like you. Um, hope they hope that your idea is so awesome that it can, that they, you know, one, do I have time to read it? I've got, you know, 27 other things I'm trying to do right now. Um, but that's one. Okay. So I'm going to assume that you don't want to just publish your game and that you absolutely want to be a publisher, or at least you've got it in your head that that's what you want to be. So I'm not here to dissuade you. You get a lot of people who talk about, you know, find something else to do. But I will say this. I, this is my day job. But, I, but again, I get insurance through my spouse, so that kind of thing makes it um, easy for me to do this. It would be more expensive if I was to do it, but I make a comfortable living um, with right publishing. I do well. Um, that's just to give you uh, a general idea of, you know, you can make a living doing this, and I'm not talking about eating ramen noodles every night. Um, you have to be frugal. You have to be smart about your business. You have to be uh, very. You have to treat it like a business, and that's the very first thing I want to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the sexy parts of uh, doing that. Um, I want to talk about you know make it a business. You know get separate your finances, your personal finances from your business's finances. Um, that really comes down to a, a big, big thing that a lot of people do not uh, do anything about. They do not separate their finances. Um, there's a very, very large company that failed to do that. Uh, Catalyst Game Labs um, failed to separate their personal finances from their uh, from their professionals when they started the, started that company and it cost them you know people left the company because of it uh, people you know, this is I hate to say this I am not a lawyer I'm not giving legal advice um, what I'm saying there is rumor I should not say that as fact it is not fact it is just rumor that I've heard I don't want to slander anybody and say that it's truth um, this is the rumor on the grapevine that I get from many many people um, but that's the kind of thing that um, we talk about 
you know you don't want to end up uh, having that kind of issue, um, especially you know when you're talking about um, you know I'm not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, that kind of stuff. Um, but you need to treat it as a business. It needs to start as a business entity. You know whether that's you want to be a sole proprietor, a general partnership, and my advice is never, ever, 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 ever have a partnership. One day, you and your friend will no longer be friends if you start a partnership because it will be a business and it will be about money and you will go your separate ways. And how many companies do you knew do you know of that no longer exist because one partner went one way and another partner went another way? Um, but those are another time. You can do limited liability partnerships, you know, limited liability companies. Um, the LLC, that's the most popular one around. Um, there's corporations. Um, you know, uh, Paizo recently went from being a limited liability company to being a uh, corporations. Start taking out your taxes. Do it now. Do it quarterly. Trust me. It doesn't sound like a big deal now and you don't care about it right now because you just want to make cool games and have fun. But if you don't do these things, your company will collapse and you will not be having fun. Um, you can, you know, you can do things with intellectual property and you have text and rules that are copyright, art is copywritten, you know, all of these lay out things and trade dress are subject to copyright okay but logos and specialized marks you know they require a trademark and you know form and function requires a patent so there's those little things but those types of things you should be discussing with a lawyer mostly you're going to be dealing uh, with copyright and publishing um, and nothing prevents somebody from developing uh, games off of your type of stuff um, from that uh, you know that kind of stuff. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the legal stuff, but it's something you really need to pay attention to, especially at the very start. You know, uh, separating your finances. You know, getting your sole proprietorship or LLC or whatever you want to do um, from that side. I really, really recommend it. You know, start with good accounting practices. And I'm not saying these things because. These are brilliant ideas on my part. These are the mistakes I've personally made about not having good accounting practices. I was fortunate in the fact that when I first started, I did everything through PayPal. So even though I had horrible accounting practices, everything was tracked for me. So when it came around time to when it came around time to pay my taxes, I could because I knew where all the money was and I had all the money and it was there and I could pay the taxes and I could pay my freelancers and you know, I at least knew where the money came from, I knew where the money went, and I could look and look it up. So, um, but you should be doing that stuff because there's, you know, you go to a convention, that's cash business. Um, that kind of stuff is there. Um, again, we're back to keeping it as a business. So, like I said, this is the very first step. You need to write up a business plan. You know, my first business plan was to create what I want to play. You know, do things the right way. You know, you do the job and then you get paid. Um, you know, there's, you, and, and you should look at your business plan and demonstrate that you have done a thorough market analysis. You know, you can look at drive through RPG to see, you know, what's selling that week and as, and as popular as RPG now. Um, you can look at Paizo's, you know, what top, what other companies are they, they selling, you know, the top downloads, the top uh, print books that they're selling. Um, Fred Hicks is extremely nice in uh, posting all of his uh, gross sales data so that you can take a look at that. You can look at uh, the sales data for uh, engine publishing. I have one that I did for one of my books in the Company of Dragons. We did the first 90 days where we displayed um, our sales data um, about that particular PDF product that was a bestseller. So, you know, it's there for you to look at. Um, you know, that type of market analysis that you need to do and be sure about uh, what you're getting into so that you know the financials of it. Um, you can look at Kickstarter. Kickstarter's financial data is pretty much plain to see and you can go look at it and figure out, you know, what money was gathered and 
you know, you can ask questions about people. You know, this is a really nice industry and people will answer their questions. Fred Hicks is an amazing guy and he pretty much gives you a breakdown of how, you know, how much he spends on shipping and how much, you know, he spends on, you know, what he pays people to write for them. Um, you know, what he pays to edit and so forth. Um, there's many people out there who discuss those types of things and you need to do that type of market analysis um, because you need to know what you're talking about. Um, and just not go into it blindly. These are these are things I've made mistakes on and didn't do. So remember, I'm telling you from hindsight, which is 2020, these are the things you should do. So please, please, if you believe nothing else, trust me in these. Um, you know, include information in your business plan about a need or a gap in your target market. You know, when I look at Pathfinder RPG, when I first started, I saw that, you know, Pathfinder ended its support at 15th level and really didn't do much after that. So our very first big line product for Pathfinder RPG was the Colosseum Morphium. It was a high level adventure for 15th to the 20th level and that's our target market. That's the kind of thing you can do when I'm talking about a, a need or an existing gap. Um, the re one of the reasons I think our Diceless game is so successful is because there wasn't one with active support. Um, going on and there still isn't we are the you know lords of gossamer shadow dice is role playing is the only one that has constant active support you know we release something every month for that uh, product to continue to give support to folks out there um you know because you need to talk about how you're going to fill that gap um you know you might talk about um, numenera maybe it needs adventures on the same level as the Pathfinder Adventure Paths, you know, it doesn't have it. I don't know. I don't. I don't track it enough. It's not something I do. But what is Fifth Edition going to need if they OGL that? You know, those are the types of things you can be looking at. Um. So why should you listen to me on these little things? So let's talk about you know right publishing, um, for a minute so that you get an idea of who I am because I don't know how much you know about me. So Wright Publishing was formed in March of 2008. Um, it's founded by me, Stephen D. Russell. Um, I'm the only full-time employee and I have about 50 freelancers. They're all independent contractors. Uh, my relevant work experience before working, uh, I was a manager for a rent-to-own industry. I did sales, I did retention, I did customer service work in the cable TV, internet, and phone industry. Uh, before I came to be a full-time publisher. So I had a lot of sales, uh, keeping customers coming back. Um, yet you need that in the rent-owned industry and in the cable TV industry. Um, and customer service was huge for both of those, you know, because you don't keep customers coming back giving you the same amount of money every month unless you're doing your job. Um, that was the kind of thing that I, I excelled at. So I tried to carry that over into this. So. Um, I hope I do a good job. I hope, our, and you know, we we've grown, so I must say we must be doing a good job. But um, moving on from there, um, we produce the extremely popular Lords of Gossamer Shadow Dice this game. Uh, we have the Any award-winning, uh, the demolished ones for Fate, as well as products for, of course, Pathfinder role-playing game, uh, including some of our big ones like a Thousand and One Spells, Heroes of Jade Oath, and the Drive-Through RPG Platinum. Uh, bestseller, the Book of Monster Templates. I love monster templates. Um, uh, we also produce uh, printable 2D battle maps for Jonathan Roberts' fantastic maps. Uh, we have some printable 3D paper models. We have spell cards. We have character cards. Um, we have the pathways easy. And we have a lot, lot, lot of stuff. Um, the initial events investment for my company was $250. And I think right now we're in the top 1% at drive through RPG. The last I looked at their analysis, I think I'm number 20 or 22, depending on, you know, 22 of the active tabletop RPG publishers on drive through RPG. So that gives you an idea of, of where I'm at kind of in the industry, as far, at least as far as electronic sales uh, books go. Um, you know, that doesn't count people like Steve Jackson Games and other companies like that that don't sell anything through drive through But, you know, it, it's something to say that I'm there and that, that one of the largest, you know, online outlets for our works, you know, pays attention to what I'm doing. Um, 
In the past, we've had print distribution partnerships with Cubicle 7 and Chronicle City, uh, neither of which worked um, out real well. My future ideas is to hope maybe to do uh, our own print runs and print distribution partnerships, probably through something like Studio 2 Publishing or PSI as fulfillment houses. Uh, I want to grow the line of Lord of Gossamer and Shadow and get it out to more people. Um, uh, that, that's something you need to do too. You need to describe the nature of your business, you know, and list the marketplace that needs that you're trying to satisfy. I guess that's the best way to explain it. You know, explain how your books are going to meet those needs. These are descriptions not just for you, but it gives you an overarching vision. This sounds all silly and business like and everything, but it really can help ground you in especially not so much at the beginning, but it can help you come back when you feel like you're losing focus. You can go back and look and say, you know, where are we making the mistakes now? What are we missing? You know, look at the very beginning of where you started and what what's the core values that made things work for you. Um, I, we have specific customers that I try to cater to and and serve those specific types of needs. You know, I want to do uh, we were very much targeted in a very, you know, I did Dysis because I felt like the, you know, nobody was serving my needs for for a uh, a Dysis game that I loved with Amber Dysis role playing. I thought it was probably one of the most interesting games I'd ever played, and I didn't feel like anybody was serving that need in the marketplace. Um, and some of the things that I felt we could offer for Pathfinder was a big deal. So you know, I'm not talking about these things from an abstract point of view. I'm talking about how I really use them in every day. Uh, you know, we talk about you're going to have to explain competitive advantage in your uh, your business plan. What are you going to what's going to make you better than every other company out there that's going to be doing this? Well, one, it's got me. My, that's just me. You know, my ego. That's as Lewis Porter Jr.'s Jr. Uh, sort of says, I'm smarter than you, and I'll prove it. And that's the kind of thing. But um, that's not really how I work. I, I'm not here. I'm not here because I'm smarter than everybody else. What I do how do, however, is I have a really keen eye for spotting talented people, people who are smarter and more talented than I am, and I hire those people. Um, you know, we want those types of personnel that the freelancers that are just experts, you know, they're, they're the top of their game or really raw talent, you know, that just needs time and honing and uh, becoming amazing, you know, and we try to be more efficient than our competitors, um, whether that's in finding talented artists who are willing to work at the budget that we have set or finding um, ways that we can improve doing things ourselves, you know, whether it's me learning uh, in design so that I can do my own layout, or whether it's um, hiring someone like Jason Rainville, a brilliant artist, uh, when he was really young and raw and still learning his craft, and now he works for Paizo and uh, Wizards of the Coast. You know, those are the types of things that I really push to try to do is find those people who are just brilliant. Um, and keep looking because you know once you hire them you know uh, Joe Shawcross uh, did a lot of work for us and he does a lot of work now for uh, Dream Scarred Press uh, Juan Diego DeAndres has done a huge amount of work for us he's also done work for Lewis Porter Jr. Um, the, the, those types of people are out there and they will come along with, especially when they when people see them and see their work um, you know they'll reach out and, and talk to them um, uh, you know, look at what made certain other games successful so you can learn from them in your business plan. You know, what made Numenera successful? Monty Cook, you know, but he also had, you know, it, 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 it's great to say that Numenera is a great setting and it has great art and it has uh, amazing layout. All that comes from Monty Cook's talent and know how and time in the industry. And all that, you know, it, anybody could have done Thundar the Barbarian millions of years in the future, but, you know, Monty Cook did his spin on it, and that's his talent. What made Kevin Culp's Time Watch 
uh, so awesome. Not everybody has to be Numenera, okay? But um, we talk about um, that kind of stuff. What direct marketing are you going to do? You know, for your print and PDF customers. You know, uh, how are you going to sell directly to your to your people? So you're going to need a website. Maybe you use PayPal like I do. That kind of thing needs to be in your business plan. You know, what's your plan for Kickstarter? You know, um, like I said, we'll I will talk more about that later. But you need a plan. Um, you know, what's your plan for using drive through You know, how are you going to make fat uh, a good place? You better research how it works and understand how other people use it. You know, what's your plan for traditional distribution? Do you have, do you plan to use it at all? Do you plan to just, just you know, sell through Amazon? Um, that kind of stuff is very, very important um, so that you know what you're going to do with your company. And all of this sounds incredibly boring. And sometimes it is, but it needs to be a big part of your business plan. You need to think about how are you going to get a thousand regular customers to spend a hundred dollars a month on what you do. It's a hundred thousand dollars a year, but that's gross. You're going to have to pay your freelancers. You're going to have to pay your Taxes, you're going to have to pay, you know, production on physical books and so forth. So you might get $50,000 out of that, but that's $50,000 you've got. You know, I don't know too many people who are going to sneeze at $50,000 and not, you know, pick up the money that's sitting there on the table, but you need a plan for that kind of thing. You know, goals about how you're, what, what you consider, you know, the first growth of your company. Um, you know, is your goal to sell 100 PDFs in the first 30 days? You know, is your goal to sell 50 in the first 30 days? Is your goal just to sell, you know, one copy, you know, just to get started? You know, that kind of stuff. Is your goal to to uh, be as big as, you know, Monty Cook or to be as big as Watsi or as big as Paizo, you know? And so look at how they got there and how long it took them to get there. Um, and not just the name of the company Paizo, look how long it took Lisa Stevens to get to be Paizo. Um, that kind of thing. You know, there's a great book out there uh, called Dungeons and Designers. You can read it, the history, and it can teach you a lot about how long it took people to get where they are now. Um, so that you can think about this kind of scale that you're on starting your company and where you're going to be 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, one of the good things about RPGs are they're not seasonal or cyclical, they're purchases all the time. So, you know, how many customers can you gain? You know, look at Kickstarter, you know, 10,000 customers for fate. You know, you need to have that small target. Maybe your target is not a thousand regular customers, maybe your target is 50, 50 regular customers. You know, still, that's a good target to start with. You know, every customer counts when you're first starting. So that kind of thing is really out there. You know, you need to look at your gross margins, you know, your costs. Um, you need to manage all that, you know. And all this stuff needs to guide your pricing and promotional decisions as you're, as you're looking at those kind of things. Um, you need to do competitive analysis. Uh, you know, it's... A hard thing to do in the tabletop RPG industry, especially for me, because most of these people are my colleagues, and a lot of them are my friends personally. You know, I'm a very, it's no secret that Owen and I, Owen Stevens and I talk, and uh, I consider him a personal friend, but technically he's a competitor as well. Uh, you know, we use the same, you know, we're chasing after the same Pathfinder dollars in a lot of ways with products we release. Um, so how do I identify my competition by product line or services or market segment or whatever you want to use to anal analyze it, whether I, we talk about this person, you know, Owen focuses a lot on, oh, let's not use Owen. Owen's a personal friend of mine. I don't want to use Owen. Let's talk about, there's a good example. Let's talk about a major one. Let's talk about Cobalt Quarterly. 
I know Wolf Gengar, he's a great guy, he's been extremely helpful to him. But there's no question that uh, Cobalt Quarterly is probably the most prominent third-party publisher of Pathfinder material. It's also a third-party creator for WotC, 5th edition. Um, you know, they're the only company that has produced something uh, for uh, Pathfinder that's been published by Paizo physically, but they created it, and that was from sea to shore. Um, you know, what kind of market share do they have over everybody else? You know, when they release a product, even when it was just Cobalt Quarterly bundles, they were at the top of the Paizo sales charts. Um, that's the kind of company Col Cobalt Press is. It is a I shouldn't say, yeah, Cobalt Press, open design, whatever you want to call it back in the day, but Cobalt Press is, you know, the 200-pound gorilla in the third-party community room, and Wolfgang is, you know, that a lot, comes a lot from Wolfgang's design talent, it comes from his business savvy, it comes from his wife's influence and support, uh, there's a lot there, it comes from a lot of the talented designers he uses, and who are very reliable, I use them, Ben McFarlane's a good friend of mine, um, that kind of stuff. So, you know, we'll, if, if there's ways to look at that to give you ideas, you know, take a look at Deep Magic and how big that Kickstarter was. How many customers he had for it, and how many, how much money he gen generated. And you can look at every other Kickstarter he did. You can look at how many likes he has on his uh, Facebook page and compare it to every other publisher. You know, and see how strong that is versus um, everybody else. Um, you know, and where he draws his customer base from. Um, you have strengths and weaknesses that are there. Um, Cobalt Press focuses on very high-end, high-quality, uh, larger books. Um, he sometimes does small stuff, but it doesn't seem to catch the fire like his big projects do. Um, and that's something, you know, whether that's that, that's a tremendous strength for him, but like any strength, you can do something with this. If you do smaller, faster, you know, you can operate, you know, what's the new hot thing this week? It's more easier for you as a smaller company to be more agile and, and take advantage of those types of things. Now, I'm not trying to say that you're going to be the next Cobalt Press. I'm just giving you examples of how you need to examine these things, you know. You know, how important is your target market to your competitors? The really the best place you want to target is someplace Cobalt Press, Wright Publishing, Frog God Games, you know, whoever uh, doesn't care about or is not being served. Uh, one of the great examples that uh, of that is the Way of the Wicked. Fire Mountain Games came in and brought in a uh, great adventure path for evil people segment of the market of people who wanted to play evil characters in a long-term adventure path that weren't being served. There you go. That's the kind of uh, folks you're dealing with. And it's a great campaign, and it's really awesome, and Way of the Wicked Stands is probably one of the most interesting uh, examples of uh, targeting uh, a target market. Uh, when we're talking about stuff like that, you know, Dysus is another one. I can, I can, you know, we had a very specific target of people that I felt weren't being served and uh, to keep, you know, doing stuff for them. Um, you know, what is your, you know, what are your bar what are your barriers to enter that market? Well, Paizo, you know, to do support for them, it's it's getting harder and harder because the market is incredibly saturated. Um, we set a pretty high bar for everybody with Paizo because it's hard to do just, you know, a cheap black and white low art thing, but, you know, then you go and see Raging Swan Press do that. Um, black and white artwork with high quality writing, but, you know, limited uh, graphics, you know, compare that to Paizo's top end. Design. So, you know, again, how you present yourself can help you get past some of those barriers, you know, and, and you can turn a barrier into like what, uh, Raging Swan pressed it. Raging Swan Press, press. Well, we don't know any great artists who can do really great covers for the price that we can afford, so let's just do the Traveler method and put up a black and white cover, you know, that's very simple. This is what we're doing. The name, that's it. You know, here's the logo. Blah. We're done. Awesome. You know, um, what's your window of opportunity to enter the market, you know? Uh, when is 4th edition becoming 5th edition? When is 
uh, Savage Worlds going to stop producing stuff? You know, when am I? What kind of window do I have to produce my vision for a great tabletop game? You know, before somebody else introduces their great version of it. You know, uh, Strands of Fate is a great example that came in with just the right timing before Fate Core came out. Um, with a very generic style fate game. That, that was kind of the, the, when you're talking about windows of opportunity, there was a window there. There's a window before somebody else does their thing. So, um, are there any indirect or secondary competitors who may impact your success? Um, we had a guy who was doing a diceless book called Lords of, God, Lords of Olympus. Could it have impacted us? Yes. Did it get out to market before we did? Yes. Um, is it a good game? I don't know. I didn't pick it up and read it, but I've had I've had I've I've had people say good th good things about it. But it's a single standalone book, and that's awesome. I have a single standalone book with the demolished ones, but that's not what we decided to do. So you need to be prepared. How are you going to be different from that secondary competitor? Um, you know, what's a barrier to the market? You know, not knowing who the quality personnel are to hire can be um, that kind of uh, big impact on you. Um, Pathways was created to give me better freelancers and more freelancers to be able to draw a pool from. Um, I didn't want to always be beholden to a specific artist to one day have him raise his rates because he got cooler or got hired by cooler people or felt he deserved more money. That's great. I believe you do earn more money, but we still have a budget. You know, the Pathfinder market's tough. So that means I have to be very, very frugal with what we do. Now we pay more for art for the Dices line a lot of times. We don't do as much black and white artwork. For, we don't do any black and white work for the for the Dices line. That's the kind of stuff that, that you know, can make a difference for uh, that. Um, where do I find... Uh, good writers for Pathfinder. Where do I good find good price writers for Diceless? Um, sometimes you have to take a chance um, and hire somebody off a recommendation of somebody else, and it can turn out disastrous. Or you know you can shift through a lot of people and shift a lot of sand and find diamonds. So, um, kind of talk a little bit more about this, but uh, single owner. That's my business plan. That's what I recommend to you because, again, we talked about partnerships before. Um, you can also, this some is called a horizontal strategy. Sometimes I call it the conversion strategy. Um, same type of pro products to different users. So we have the Breaking of Foster Nagar. We have it available for Pathfinder role playing game. It's a great awesome adventure. It was written for the Pathfinder role-playing game. It's been sitting there for a while, but it's got awesome maps. It's got awesome artwork. It's an awesome adventure, and I don't think System, especially, you know, I'm the kind of guy who plays Diceless, and I play Pathfinder, so I don't think System is as ingrained as what you need. You just need somebody who loves the system and truly has mastery of it. So when we do a conversion, you know, if Patrick Adamanski comes to me and says, hey, Steve, I think it would be awesome to have a 13th age adventure. And I love that one. It's awesome. And I'd really like to do the conversion. And he's really gifted with 13th age. Uh, okay, go right ahead. And then we do the same thing for 5th edition. You know, um, it's a similar style of game. So I think it moves across to that user base. Um, that's the kind of thing you talk about sometimes. Um, Cobalt Press, excellent example of it today. Uh, 13th Age of Deep Magic after having done it for Pathfinder. Um, I think Freeport's been done for True 20 Fate, Savage Worlds, it's all over the place. But that's the kind of um, idea you're talking about with that. Um, have a plan for promotions, advertising, public relations, selling to people personally at conventions. Um, have other printed materials that, that help you uh, sell, like brochures, catalogs, flyers, etc. Have a plan. What are you going to do? Are you going to do those things? You don't necessarily have to do a brochure. You don't have to do a cat catalog. You know, it might be an electronic catalog, if anything. But, you know, you might think about it, um, you know, what it's going to cost you to hand out 
something like that if you if you reach that size where catalogs necessary but it can be important um, you know you'll have direct mailings social media your website message boards blogs a video cast a podcast um, advanced reviews if you can get somebody to review your product a video promotion you know just you sitting around with a group of people playing your game showing people how to play um, you know teaching people how to play through video video is awesome you know it, you know even if it's just showing people how to make a character um, you have friends fellow you know fans whatever those are your minions those are your, they can help you sell stuff especially when you're starting out just ask them you know Hey, can you? What, how? If somebody says, "How can I help you?" You say, "Hey, just share it on social media. Uh, talk about it in a message board. You know, talk about it in your blog. Talk about it on your video blog. Um, you know, and, and remember, turn your fr freelancers into salespeople. They are your creators and writers and stuff, and they care more about your product than you do. So they're happy to go out there a lot of times and talk it up. You know." Uh, I love Fred Hicks. He has a great saying, you know, you talk about non-disclosure agreements, but there's also a required disclosure agreement where you talk about your product. Um, you know, it, it's a hard thing to do, but I also think that um, you need to develop financial pro projections um, after you've analyzed the market and set clear objectives for yourself. That's a hard thing to do because there's not a lot of information out there. But, um, you know, make a good adjustment, even whether it's I want to sell 25 copies, 50 copies, or 100 copies in the first 30 days of electronic books. Those are clear objectives. Set that objective. You know, even if you, and, and you know, forecast where it's going to go and what date you think you want to reach it by. And you know, whether that's 25, 50, 75, 100. Um, that kind of thing is really hard to do, but again, I've tried to give you ideas of where you can look at. Um, this is all in your business plan, remember. This is to give you an idea so that you have a roadmap toward where you want to go. Because someday you'll get lost and you may need to look back at this. Um, niche. Niche. We've talked a little bit about this, but which areas are your competitors extremely well established? And which areas are being ignored by your competitors? Those are the potential opportunities for your business in the tabletop role-playing game industry if you're small. You know, you know there might be 18,000 customers for Numenera. There might be 22,000 customers for Dresden Files. There might be 30,000 customers for Paizo. Um, these are just numbers I'm pulling out of my behind here um, uh, you know wild guesses I'm sure I'm wildly off on a lot of these because again there's just not a lot of data out there it's very kept back um, but where like I said Numenera there's a great example there where you're talking about let's create an adventure path for it you know Numenera has licensing you can talk to Monty you can talk to Shannon that kind of stuff is out there um, fate you want to do support for fate it's out there you want to do support for dungeon world it's out there you want to do support for 13th age it's a possibility do support for pathfinder do support for um call of cthulhu they're very open to that savage worlds is out there um all that kind of stuff you know you want to find something even if it's or do something completely independent and new um but figure out a niche that you're going to uh, handle that. I don't think that system has a lot to do with it. Um, I don't think you need, like I said, you're going to have to find your own niche that people are ignoring or not being served, um, and look for that. Look for that advantage and find it there. Um, you know, what do I think advantages are out there for you right now? Why would I tell you? I have my own ideas about where I'd want to go. I talked a little bit about Numenera because I don't have anything to do with it, but occasionally I glance at it. Now, that may have been a year ago that I thought of that idea, but it's there, and it may or may not have already been done, but take a look at it. You know, that kind of stuff is out there. It's an opportunity. Um, 
that's pretty much a lot of the business plan, but I want to cover just a few last things about business so that we can get all the business stuff out of the way in the very first video. Get assistance, either from a publisher that you know, a publisher you want to make friends with, somebody who has the time to train or you can study under, or just learn and study what those blog writers do, okay? You know, um, you know, you have your online presence. You need to make sure that that's there. You will, you know, we use print on demand or fulfillment houses like Studio 2 Publishing or Publisher Services uh, Incorporated, you know, to get your product to the market, you know, like Amazon Create Space and electronic books. And if you're doing Pathfinder, let's say you will ship physical print on demand books to Paizo and D20 Pathfinder SRD.com. Um, Determine what's best for you when we talk about sole proprietorship, partnerships, limited liability companies, corporations, you know, that kind of stuff. Figure out what's best for you. Talk to a lawyer, you know, hopefully you have a friend. Um, but it's not necessarily a dumb idea to, to investigate that. Um, register your business name, get your tax ID number. Register for state and local taxes. I can't say this enough. You will be so mad at yourself if you make a great, awesome company and you have to close it down because you can't afford to pay your taxes because all of a sudden you get a $10,000 tax bill because you had an amazing game and you made $100,000 that year. And even with all your payouts to freelancers and your purchases of programs and computers and so forth, you still have to pay. You know, and you didn't set the money aside and do it quarterly like you should have. Um, that kind of stuff. Um, learn about your independent contractors, your freelancers, and how you pay them. Record what you pay them for tax purposes. Um, you know, again, I'm simple. I do PayPal. It gives me a simple record. Um, that's pretty much all my business advice. But again, this is about starting your own tabletop role-playing game company and all this sounds really boring and all this sounds like oh my god why would I waste time with this I just want to produce this game well if what you want to produce this game and let somebody else deal with this kind of responsibility it's work it's a business and when I say sometimes I see people saying you know some people are role-playing businessmen I know I'm a businessman because this is my job this pays my mortgage this pays my rent this pays my taxes puts gas in my car and food on my table I'm not kidding around um, when I say these things again I'm saying them not because I think I'm smarter than you but because I've made all of these dumb errors by not doing it in the first place and I've had to do it retrospectively other than the tax thing I've been good about the taxes but I, because I saw somebody else lose their entire company because one partner in the company who was responsible for paying the taxes and was the treasurer didn't do that and that's why I'm so much against partnerships but that kind of thing can be really crazy so this is the first part of um, you know running your own table creating your own tabletop RPG company um, this is the first segment of that I don't know how many segments there will be but I felt you guys, you know, I get asked it a lot, and this is the first video I have to talk about that. If you have questions, uh, please leave them in the notes, and I'll try to, to write them down and then uh, address them in the next video segment. Um, next time, we will talk about how to get started with your first product, and uh, it's going to be called Start Small, and we'll talk about why you don't start with your dream project as your very first book out the door. Um, my name is Stephen D. Russell uh, from Wright, the CEO of Wright Publishing. This is Wright Designs. We went about 15 minutes over today. I'm going to try to keep these to uh, 30 minutes, but uh, again, there was a lot of information to cover, but it's really, really important when that you start your business as a business. Thank you so much. Good gaming, folks.